Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very accomplished and senior bureaucrat from India, from New Delhi, India, uh, Mr. Subhash Garg. Subhashi, welcome to the show. Very much. Thank you to you, Ashutosh. So, thanks a lot. Thank I you. look forward to this conversation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Subhash Garg is the former Finance and Economic Affairs Secretary, Government of India. He's an author, and all of you know I'm always very partial to authors. He's an author of a book titled, We Also Make Policy. And after that, he wrote The 10 Trillion Dream, uh, an explanation and a commentary on the budget 23-24. Uh, Mr. Garg is also an economic and fiscal policy strategist and advisor. So before we speak about your book, tell me a little bit about your own journey, because I've always said people who are from the IAS always have a very exciting journey. I, uh, uh, Ashutosh, had a fabulous uh, journey, so to say. The childhood was a little bit of a struggle, thanks to the economic conditions, etc. But I uh, could make it to the uh, to the IAS in first possible attempt. Uh, got into the fourth rank, all India, according to my exactly. color, Rajasthan, and had thirty six years of fabulous um, uh, service, both in the states state of Rajasthan as well as in India. I also could serve as uh, the executive director in the World Bank. So, and finally, in, uh, as Secretary of Economic Affairs, mm. this was the icing on the cake, the rest of the policy making positions which an IS officer can aspire. Mm. So I had a fabulous uh, career in the IS. And now uh, I don't call myself retired. Uh, I switched career, now I'm into, more of a public space. So I do read a lot, write a lot, speak a lot. Mm. Uh, that's what is partly evident in the three books, which I have already done. Amazing. And many more are coming. I'm sure many more books will be in the pipeline. <laughs> and I look forward to speaking about to you about those books as and when you release them. So let's talk, uh, Subhaji, about your book, We Also Make Policy. What inspired you to write a behind-the-scenes account of the finance ministry's proceedings? See, uh, finance ministry has uh, one of the biggest role in economic policy making. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost everywhere, thanks to the budget it controls, thanks to the uh, policy making it makes in monetary space, fiscal space, economic space and all. Um, and I uh, felt one thing always in our uh, system uh, that the, uh, the government is not as transparent about plus policy making as sharing about the policy making as it should. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that the policy makers, whether they are the ministers or the senior civil servants, don't write about India to let. Mm -hmm. In my judgment, public has enormous stake in knowing the um, making of the policy, what went behind it, what are the different considerations, competing uh, considerations, and all. And therefore, uh, I felt uh, um, the two years which I spent there, the numerous, enormously important public interest matters. Mm. I thought uh, I owe it to the people, to the nation that I must write. Um, and that's the reason why this book is there. Fascinating, fascinating. So I'm going to ask all our viewers and listeners to go and check out Mr. Subhash Garg's book. We also make policy. I will also have a closer look at it again. My next question to you is that, you know, and India's liberalization really started in 1991. And I was fortunate enough to be a part of Prime Minister Narsimha Rao's delegation that had first gone to Singapore with Mr. Van Mohan Singh and Mr. Chidambaram. But my question is, how has India's economic policy evolved over the years? And where do you see us heading in the future? See, the, uh, the, the very definitive transitions which have happened in India's economic policy making. When we got independent, um, the world was socialist, world was communist uh, um, thinking at that time. Uh, people, the countries were coming out from 
the colonization. So everyone thought, um, and that's what the uh, prime ministers in the cabinet of that time thought that let us go the socialist way of life. Uh, the public sector is the where the most investment should go. And so we adopted um, an economic policy which was based on reserving very large space in economic sphere mm -hmm. for the public sector, uh, controlling the private sector, thinking that they are the uh, guys who work for themselves, not for um, the, the country. It's a wrong uh, uh, in interpretation, assumptions. Um, and that is what shaped up the economic policy for about 40, 45 years of our first mm -hmm. existence. It became vicious, more um, uh, this license for Madras, controlling everything. Right. Um, and the, right. the, the ills of that, uh, the suboptimal performance of that was visible by the time we got into 70s, 80s. Uh, and that is where, as you uh, mentioned, 1991 mm -hmm. will mark the big uh, watershed moment where we re-embarrassed um, the, uh, the capitalism, the mm -hmm. private sector, uh, opened every uh, uh, sector of the economy to private sector, mm -hmm. uh, started controlling private uh, investments, um, public, uh, public sector investments. And started welcoming the foreign investments mm -hmm. technology. So that phase started. Um, uh, I think that is still not fully completed. Um, we now have um, private sector in almost every sector of the economy, uh, defense, or space, those sectors which were not uh, conceivable at any point of time are also now open. Uh, but still we have a very large um, private sector a uh, public sector mm -hmm. uh, in certain spaces like railways um, power etc uh, the story is not complete of the reforms so i think one thing which we will see in times to come is that this process of um, privatization closing and downsizing of the public sector in financial as well as non-financial space takes place and secondly, to my mind, um, the issues which have become big issues for, from the industrialization of the last 200 years, mm -hmm. that is the uh, pollution, climate, and also the promises which are um, uh, which the digital revolution is offering. Mm -hmm. I think these will also shape up the economic policy of the times to come. Mm -hmm. So we don't miss the new digital as well as the environmental bus, unlike what we missed the industrialization, thanks to the wrong policy choice of socialism. Very interesting. And given the complexities of economic policy making, how does the Ministry of Finance or government ensure transparency and public trust? See, the, uh, the uh, system in the country, the institutional uh, system to foster the public trust and transparency was um, in a way um, in constant certain institutional arrangements. Mm. One of them, for example, is uh, a very uh, good scrutiny of the parliament. Mm. Uh, all the budget you make goes to the parliament. The parliament is supposed to uh, debate that, uh, bring it all aspects of it to the public. And as public's representative, people in Lok Sabha or state assemblies are supposed to approve that. Unfortunately, uh, in our country, uh, uh, because of this anti-defection and other kind of policies which we have mm -hmm. followed, the uh, parliamentary scrutiny has um, uh, gone down massively. And um, this is unfortunate. Parliament assemblies have become largely the rubber stamping mm. uh, institutions for what the government offer. That has hurt, in my judgment, the public trust massively. Um, uh, part of that is made up by the judicial activism. The uh, judicial side has, uh, uh, but there have been occasions uh, and times when um, even the judiciary, um, judicial review and um, uh, so, uh, so scrutiny had also got in a way compromised mm -hmm. a little bit. Lastly, to my mind, um, we had built uh, a very 
uh, much independent civil service, which was supposed to be a, a good check, in fact, mm -hmm. besides being a contributor, that you don't go uh, for the solutions which are short termist uh, kind of thing or which are um, which tend to benefit only the uh, uh, political party in power. Um, the they have been outstanding civil servants, but by and large, uh, a large majority of the civil servants have accepted more subordinate and non-scrutinizing, non-independent role. Mm -hmm. So my sense is that uh, the public trust in the economic policy making has uh, in a way um, uh, gone down in the country. Mm -hmm. I, I think we'll need to restore that, uh, build, rebuild institutions um, and practices to make. Uh, we don't, these days, put out our bills into the public domain for debate uh, before they are, uh, the way many bills are brought in uh, just at the nick of the time without, I think that all need to be uh, taken care of to restore the public confidence. Very well said, thank you. I'm now going to move to the budgets, uh, Swashi, and I know as the author of three union budgets, I'd love to get your perspective of what goes into handling the intense pressure and responsibility. All that I as a common person see is on the 28th of January, a leather briefcase and now maybe an iPad with the finance minister. But what goes be behind building the budget must be something incredible. See, it's now 1st February, not 28th February. I know, it's changed now, yes. <laughs> it's changed now. And yeah. you rightly know that it is changed to the iPads. Yes. Uh, feed of, though the iPad is still carrying to that, uh, either the, the ladies' bag or yeah. the, the, the uh, uh, red bag. Hmm. Uh, you, you rightly highlighted, uh, it's a country of 140 crore people, um, a three trillion, three and a half trillion uh, economy um, uh, with a uh, very large public sector, very large private sector, um, enormous amount, our land masses. So, so and all that uh, uh, sort of ambitions, aspirations, uh, considerations, interests, in a way, coils when you uh, try to make the budget for the country. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the government has a huge role in promoting economic growth, public um, uh, interest, redistribution, taking care of the public goods and other things. Mm -hmm. So I can understand uh, what is in your mind when you ask this question. Mm -hmm. uh, to be able to handle that, I think three things are um, required. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, that the guys who are involved in the budget making knows the, the challenge, mm -hmm. uh, knows what resources we have available, knows what um, uh, is the is the way to, what, what is the way these resources have been allocated, are they suboptimally or they're well allocated and um, sort of then weave them into the kind of schemes and programs where mm -hmm. the uh, the country and the people can benefit. This is one. The second thing to my mind is um, it's very necessary. And that is where many times I think civil servants might falter. Um, we must be uh, very much aware that uh, ultimate responsibility of policy making mm -hmm. or budget making is the political executive right. because that is what they need to sort of use um, to uh, in a way get re-elected but at the same time also uh, do what they thought hmm. is for the people uh, because they, they have people's mandate in a way so to understand their motivations their uh, understanding their interests, etc., is also uh, uh, very important. Not that to serve if you have an illegitimate interest or, uh, but to know it is very necessary, even if you have to sort of come in the way of um, uh, somebody hijacking the budget for a wrong, uh, wrong mm. considerations. And lastly, to my mind, I think uh, the civil servant who in charge of the budgets if uh, he has or she has 
a good understanding of what is the real public interest mm -hmm. how does uh, how do you serve the real interest of the country in terms of growth redistribution poverty and all i think if you have these um, the three good understanding mm -hmm. uh, you can um, sort of withstand the kind of pressures and come up with solutions programs and answers mm -hmm. which perhaps can uh, serve the interest best mm -hmm. fascinating and yet uh, you know when you were put together a union budget you have people probably writing in from all over the country you know, whether it's political leaders, whether it's members of parliament, whether it's industrialists, associations. My question is, what are some of the unseen challenges in putting a union budget together? I think um, you are right. Uh, the, the, the kind of um, suggestions, views, requests, demand, whatever you may call them, uh, comes in at that point of time. Mm. To be honest, you, you don't have even time to look at all of them. Uh, you then try to distill, look at something. And uh, it's also because many times the, these tend to be very um, repetitive, same thing being said, mm -hmm. whereas you are uh, running short of, short of time. Mm -hmm. But to answer your um, uh, question about unseen, I think the biggest unseen factor to my mind uh, uh, which is, uh, I would say, unexpressed or not fully understood kind right. of thing, is the uh, expectation in the country mm -hmm. that the government can solve every problem. Right. right. Or government has resources to take care of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and that is where too much of a my bap kind of government, too much of expectations... Whereas the fact is that 95% of the value right. in the economy is generated by the private people. Uh, that, is, uh, that is where hmm. they generate the value. And hmm. who provides all the labor which goes into the uh, economic value creation? It is the private people. Hmm. Government takes tax from them mm -hmm. to give back to the uh, sections of the society which right. needs Correct. or to invest in those um, areas where growth can come up or mm. provide the public goods and services, mm. defense, etc., which is the responsibilities. I, I, I get a sense that this is not understood. Mm. There's too much of um, un, unrealistic expectations from the government. Mm. That makes it harder for the government. Mm. If you look at the kind of budget speeches which we have been delivering in the last couple of years, uh, the political executive tries to sort of make sure that every section of the society Every interest is mentioned in the budget in one way or the other. Right. Is anything real being given or not is a different matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, this demystification of the role of the government, I think, is very much necessary for um, uh, uh, for for the uh, the budgets to be of real real um, mm -hmm. decision uh, uh, difference right. making right. in the very life well. of the country. Very well said. I'm not going to change uh, my line, you know, subject and I want to talk to you about the minimum support price. And, you know, in your position, you must have handled this a lot. I'd love to get your perspectives, Vaji, on the politics of the minimum support price and how has it impacted uh, the Indian agricultural policy and sector? See, uh, Ashutosh, when the minimum support price or MSPs as we call them more commonly um, were first designed in 60s. Right. Uh, the idea was very, very good. Mm -hmm. um, you, We were very much short of the basic cereals, which is calorie providing to us, mm -hmm. whether it's rice or wheat. And uh, the idea was that if you want to shift people or farmers to undertake cultivation and adopt what was coming at that time, the green revolution technologies of high uh, yielding variety of seeds, irrigation, fertilizer, and things like that. 
was to make um, a, a deal with the farmers that all right you do it you produce and i'll buy you uh, buy all of it at a certain price if you are not able to sell mm. it in the market mm. i think that was a very big assurance which was provided mm. and which brought the green revolution mm. in the country and we had we we are today the largest uh, sort of uh, exporter of uh, rice in the world this was unimaginable in absolutely i, I remember the pl480 uh, grains that used to exactly. come we were so, much younger so this is the uh, the the promise of the msp but now we have another problem in our country right everything we succeeds hmm. uh, we then tend to uh, we tend to make it apply, applicable everywhere hmm. and that dilutes it so over last 30 40 years the msps have become a kind of because you 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 know it at the what uh, at, at be, behind uh, the the green revolution still is uh, uh, is uh, 10 to 12 crore farmers right. and if you look at their families that number is 50 to 60 crores and they are the voters of the country right. uh, and uh, you need to get their votes and mm. that is where the um, symbolism the destructive aspect of it that you extend it to every um, uh, crop do it it's so so uh, obvious but still we don't see it right. today when the msp has been extended and I, there is a chapter in the uh, uh, in the book about the government decision to provide 50% profit minimum mm. on all the crops but today uh, milk and proteins and other things mm. contribute much more towards the farmer's income than all the cereals put together right. Right. Uh, we don't have any MSP for milk or, and that same revolution is happening now in fruits and vegetables. Right. Again, there is no MSP there, right? And MSP is limited to about 30 to 35% right. of the value of the agricultural crops. Mm -hmm. But that is where all the politics is all about. Mm -hmm. So I think time has come. Uh, and by the way, the purpose for which this was brought in to support shifting of the crop to make the country self-sufficient has already been achieved. I have no hesitation in saying that the, the time of today requires MSPs to be abandoned, right. done away with, rather than converting that into a legal guarantee and assuring. Absolutely. Very well said. Very well said. And maybe sometime I'll ask for another conversation on MSP because you're so right. You know, states where farmers are converting to cash crops is changing completely now. And MSP may need to be done away with. But Swaj, you have time for two more questions for you. Um, my next question is, how do international relations and geopolitics play a role in domestic economic policy and decisions? See, the, uh, the world is integrated today, uh, both in terms of uh, people's movement, technology, finance, uh, international policy making, coordination, mm -hmm. pollution, carbon, whatever you take it, the world today is an integrated. Uh, the, the, the concept of nation is more of the industrial era uh, reconstruct, but today the planet is one. And therefore, whatever is happening elsewhere affects us. We are integrated through the export channel, import channel, technology channel, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what happens in um, the rest of the world is uh, of immense value to us. And therefore, you recently saw G20 uh, playing a big part. That is the where India was uh, chairing the, uh, the, this one. So geopolitics international economic cooperation, international economic coordination mm -hmm. is of paramount importance in the days of today. Mm -hmm. We need finance, we need technology, we need markets, we need so much. And um, the the best we can figure out, we can't have uh, Atmanirbhar or that kind of thing where we are uh, sort of 
confined. We, we can no longer live the life uh, of, of a secluded uh, people. Right, right. Well said. And my last question to you, and you know, given your vast experience, I want to ask you, how do you envision India's economic landscape in the next decade based on the foundation that has been set over the years in our country? See, I wrote this book, the uh, the, the dollar ten trillion. Ten trillion dollar, yeah. The idea was to sort of uh, crystal gaze in future. How is India of twenty thirty five might look and all? In my judgment, um, we must now uh, shift our focus uh, from the aggregate GDP, which is very important. We can't. We can never fix it. But to what kind of average income we want Indians to have so that they can live a life which is fulsome, which is wholesome, mm -hmm. and which is, uh, uh, which is free from the uh, health concerns and others. So uh, to what makes it mm -hmm. happy? healthy and prosperous people is what. So uh, if I uh, may say so, if we can um, aim at, let us say, an average income in terms of dollar or $10,000 per person mm -hmm. uh, by 2035 or 2040, in 2020 prices, because dollar yeah. also depreciate, mm -hmm. you can't... Um, the same uh, number. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, so, so in 2020 prices, ten thousand dollars per in, uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. per capita income for all Indians mm -hmm. on an average. Uh, if we adopt that as a goal and then reconfigure all our policies, taking on board the technological, environmental, industrial, infra infrastructural, and all of those concerns, human development concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now in services, the sports and so much, I think we will be able to then create an India um, of what we can be uh, very happy and proud of. Fascinating. And on that note, uh, Subhaji, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for speaking to me about your journey. Thank you for speaking to me about so many different aspects of economic policy. Thank you for telling all of us about the budget and what goes into making a budget. You've been an author of three union budgets. And thank you also for speaking to me about, although very briefly, about minimum support price and economic policy. Thank you again and good luck to you. Thank you. My pleasure, Ashutosh. Look forward to future conversations. Thank you. thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.